From the APR Creation Studio, this is Unconquered with Doc Staples, bringing you the, what ordinarily would be a hot takes edition, but look, there's no hot takes at this point. These are cold, room, room temperature, reheated, allowed to go back to room temperature, and then get a little bit stale takes after Florida State gets humiliated yet again, 52-3 to three by Notre Dame this time. And honestly, I'm going to spend less time breaking down this actual game. I mean, there's just not much to talk about with this turd sandwich because you could just listen to the preview and it described what you just saw. This football team is what we think it is at this point. And it's not changing, which is also what I said during the preview You'll recall I said during the preview that I expect Notre Dame to go out and hold Florida State to, you know, three-ish, 3.2 maybe yards per play on the on the day and to run for more than six point for in the range of 6.5 yards per per carry. And I had 41 to three as the as the final. And that's pretty close. They held Florida State to three yards per play, which is right in the margin of error, and ran for 6.3 yards per carry. And let's take a look at the advanced stats. Yeah, that's that's right there. Sack adjusted uh, rush average of 7.1, right on the money. So, I mean, look, this this is exactly what we expected. And that's why I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this in terms of the you know, actual breakdown of lots of different things. I mean, there were a couple things in this game that did surprise me a little bit. One is that Florida State was able to run the football a little bit in this game, even though overall three yards per play, yes, was the case. Florida State did have success when they were patient enough to turn around and hand it to their backs. Lawrence Toafili, 16 carries, 77 yards, 4.8 yards per carry. Sam Singleton, eight carries for 47 yards, 5.9 yards per carry. I mean, those guys actually produced when they when they got their hands on the football and ran the ball. They actually were able to run the football today for one of the first times all season that they were able to run the football. In fact, they haven't looked this good running the football in terms of the combination of backs finding the yardage and the offensive line actually blocking well or reasonably well in the run game. They haven't done that so well since probably the first half of the Georgia Tech game. And this was the best defense. Look, don't get me wrong. This was the best defense Florida State has faced, and this was by far the best football team Florida State has faced. This is this is a orders of magnitude better team than anybody else Florida State has faced this year. And, you know, one of the things that stood out a bunch with this Notre Dame team is that this is a well-coached football team. I mean, you go back to that interception at the end, that was a straight up film study interception. That was okay. When they're in this formation, they have a, they have a tendency to run, you know, these three plays. And if it's this release from number two, I need to get right here because there's a real chance. There's a very good chance. There's a, you know, 50, 50 shot that the quarterback's going to try to hit that flat route coming out of the backfield. And, He's looking for it and came straight downhill. That pick six was absolutely a film study, coaching, preparation, interception, something you just don't see from Florida State and haven't seen from Florida State in a good while. Even when Florida State was dominating teams last year, you didn't see a bunch of that. You saw guys making plays. You saw guys playing within the scheme and and dominating the guy across from them a bunch, but you didn't see a whole lot of this is exactly what I expected during the, you know, during the week of, of preparation and all that. And that's a problem. That's a problem. There's one point where, uh, after the, the, the tight end slot fade for a touchdown in the first half, Riley Leonard turned to the sideline, pointed and said, you know, you told me it would be, uh, you told me it would be right there. And again, you could see like, there were a couple times where I saw Notre Dame players turn and point and go, Yup, you told me, you told me, and that is that's it. I mean, you have a, a team that at this point is a shell of itself, and you know, not 
well coordinated at this point on either side of the football against one of the best coach teams in college football with, you know, relatively comparable talent on the two sides. Although I think Notre Dame is a good bit more talented overall, on, especially when you account for the line of scrimmage. And so this is the result. Not surprising. Maybe the biggest surprise other than the fact that Florida State was able to run the football for, you know, their backs with over 100 yards rushing between the two of them and averaging around a little over five yards per carry between the two of them. Aside from that, the other big upset in this is Notre Dame absolutely figured out Florida State's punt protections and probably should have blocked three or four of them. And, you know, Florida State's done a great job last couple of years being one of the best punt cover punt operations and coverage units in the country and Notre Dame just absolutely outcoached Florida State on the special team side they outcoached him up one side and down the other in this game that was an upset that was that was surprising and I thought it was really clever what they kept doing they 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 gamed Florida State's uh protection scheme which they realized with the with the two shield in the back has it uh, they they have a counting system that they're using and depending on where the extra guy is they're going to essentially work one way or the other and Notre Dame kept lining up with one guy in one spot and then waiting for them to call the protection and make their little adjustment and then that guy would quickly run to the other side and overload and it would be too late to make the adjustment for Florida State and then they did uh, the other thing that they did a great job of is working their path so that when they were coming downhill, they didn't just run on one steady path. They did a great job of jab step and work inside to where the punter's foot's going to be kind of cut across the face of that, uh, of that personal protector blocker of that sh- uh, shield blocker. And they did just a f- fantastic job that, that just a, that is they put clinic tape out there in terms of what they did on special teams. So hats off to Notre Dame staff on that. Uh, You can absolutely see that Mike Norvell is, look, he's done with this season. He is done with working with some of these guys. You can tell he has, he, and I said this a few weeks ago, you could see that he is well past the old, you know, the old saying of don't worry when I yell at you, worry when I stop yelling at you. Norvell is well past that point with, about seven guys on his coaching staff. He's just, he's, he's beyond asking the question and chewing him out or whatever. It's the, why am I going to waste my breath on you when you're not going to be here in, a, in three weeks? That's where he's at. And I, I know that there's some of you in the audience who are like, yeah, he ain't going to fire anybody. He's too stubborn or too whatever. Y'all, I don't know where this Mike Norvell is stubborn thing came from, or that these guys are his buddies or his boys or whatever. Anybody who tells you that doesn't know what they're talking about. Either one of those. And anybody who says he's not going to be willing to make sweeping changes after this season does not know Mike Norvell or understand how deeply this is gnawing at him at this point. The man is absolutely embarrassed and he is seething. This is not a situation where on the sideline he's dead inside and just numb. He is on that sideline absolutely seething. And he's doing everything he can to stop, not to absolutely burst out with rage at every moment. This is, this is a Hulk situation where, you know, well, what's your secret? Well, my secret is I'm always angry which is where he's at. And he's just, again, he understands at this point, there's nothing you can do. You have to play out the string. You just have to pull it out, finish, finish what's going on this season. And then the cuts are going to happen. That is going to happen. Now there's some speculation. I, I saw on social media from some folks who are from other media outlets and so on saying, you know, they expect some changes This bye week in terms of guys getting pink slipped and all that, you know, maybe they've got better information on this than I do. And and that's entirely possible. I I would be surprised if those things happened before the, before the, a couple, a day or two after the Florida game, I, I, I would be surprised. I wouldn't be disappointed because I mean, I, I've said all along, I don't think there's a whole lot of benefit 
to firing guys in season. Generally, that doesn't help you much, but you've got two games left. So it's not like it's going to hurt you. And, you know, there may be a communication of, you know, this may be a way to communicate some something to the fans or whatever. So maybe that's what that what's going on. But again, I just I don't see I, I don't expect it. Like I said, I would be a little surprised, but it wouldn't hurt my feelings. It wouldn't it wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be disappointed. Just say that. And again, I'm going to continue to say I expect there to be north of six changes on the coaching staff. And depending on how you calculate them, you know, whether, you know, one guy moving from one position to another counts as a change or whatever. I think there may be in the range of eight to nine coaching changes on this coaching staff. And that's not including the back of the house in terms of scouting staff, general manager, analysts, and so on. There's going to be, I mean, you are going to see a wholesale house cleaning after this season. And you should, because, you know, two and 10, which is still the most likely record, even though I don't think it's a guarantee against Charleston Southern next week, which is, which is bonkers to say, but two and 10, which is the most likely record at this point is obviously completely unacceptable, right? Nobody is making the argument that that is acceptable. Nobody is saying that that meets the standard at Florida state. And you know who the last person who would say that that meets the standard at Florida state would be Mike Norvell, but he's going to get his opportunity and he should get his opportunity to rectify things and to bring up, bring the right guys in and to turn this over as fast as, as possible. And again, you have teams that were three win, four win teams last year that are one or zero losses this year. It is easier than ever to completely flip a football team in a season or two, even with the same head coach that you had in the prior bad season. It's easier now to flip things than it ever has been. It's also harder to be at the very top, as you saw from Georgia today. Losing to getting, frankly, stomped by Ole Miss. And Georgia's looked vulnerable more than once. I mean, they could they could be a you know three or four loss team right now. And, you know, that's the most talented roster and certainly the best recruiter in the country by a lot. Maybe not the most talented roster. It's the most highly, it's the highest recruited roster in the country. I think Ohio State's probably the most talented roster. And Ohio State's got a loss. Now, that loss is to the number one team, which is another one of the most talented rosters. To me, you know, Ohio State and Oregon thanks largely to unlimited NIL at Oregon and, you know, $21 million budget at Ohio state that was well spent on some difference makers. And that's something I think Florida state had to learn this, this cycle is they tried to kind of retain talent and fill the fill things with, with some depth, but they didn't get difference makers. They didn't go out and get Jeremiah Smith's or, or Jared versus or, or, uh, you know, a Keon Coleman, that kind of that kind of guy. You've got to have those guys on your roster. And I think that's one of the lessons that they had to learn is it doesn't really matter how many seven, let's say eight, eight level players, you know, on a scale of 10, you got, you know, eight, eight point five players. How many of those you have doesn't really matter if you don't have some tens. And, you know, there are a few guys that are basically 11s on that 10 point scale, like your Jeremiah Smith's. You know, I might even put Jared Verse in that category. But, you know, you've got to have tens. You've got to have a few tens who change the math for you and elevens who change the math for you on that scale of one to ten. This one goes to eleven. So, you know, that um that I think is something that they're gonna have to do in this cycle, is they're gonna have to play play with the big boys in terms of getting some difference makers on campus. And they're gonna have to have the coaching staff to appeal to and attract those difference makers. I do think one of the things they're going to need to have immediately is a defensive coordinator that guy that actually is magnetic that guys want to play for. And that's been an issue for them. They've lost a lot of recruits in recent years because Fuller just doesn't relate well. And guys just didn't they they weren't eager to come into town to play for him. And that's that's been a that's been a factor. And 
you know, that's got to change. But in any case, this was basically what we expected. Notre Dame was able to run the football when they wanted to run it. They didn't throw it as well as they, they would have liked, but Florida State was able to run the football, which was the surprise on offense. And then 10 of 26 for 88 yards and two picks on in the passing game. And beyond that, they also were sacked eight times in the passing game. So you think about this. Florida State threw for 88 yards and gave up eight sacks for, 51, for minus 51 yards. Do the math there. Florida State dropped back 34 times in this game. 34 dropbacks or whatever you want to call them, you know, attempts to throw the football. 34 times in this game for a total of 37 yards. Net passing yards, when you adjust for sacks, of 37 yards in 34 dropbacks. Y'all, I don't know that I've ever seen that before. Okay, at least not in like a modern team that tries to throw the football. Like that actually actively like spreads the field, has a quarterback that's supposed to throw instead of, you know, triple option or whatever. And, and here's the thing. If you go to those option teams of the past or whatever, or military academies or whatever, they're not dropping back. They're not throwing it 34 times. So I don't think I've ever seen this before. That is world-class ineptness when it comes to the, the passing game. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons why I've been clear you can't really worry about the feelings of Brock Glenn or Luke Cromenhawk in terms of whether or not you bring in a top-level quarterback transfer. If a top-level quarterback transfer wants in a guy who's won at another program, and I'm not talking about a DJ Uyunglele, I'm talking about a guy who has been really productive and has won at another program, largely because of him, because he's you know a, a, a guy that can come in and and change the way that you throw the football and you know, changes the dynamic, not a, not a manager. If you can get one of those guys on this campus and it's going to cost you both Brock Glenn and Luke Cromenhawk at this point, you have to do it. Now, if you're Luke Cromenhawk, you shouldn't be transferring anyway, because what we see from Cromenhawk at this point, again, he was better than Glenn in this game by and large, five of eight for 37 yards, had a couple on the money, didn't put the ball in danger, but also struggled to get the ball out of his hands on time, you know, all of those things. But if you can, if, if you're Croman Hawk, you, you really still need another year of development before you're fully ready. That's my view. Now I do think Florida state needs to bring in a real, uh, a, a, one of the things they need to hire is they need to bring in somebody who's a proven quarterback developer. And I'm going to say something crazy here, y'all. And I think some of you will roll your eyes hard at me and say, there's no way that this could ever happen. But if I were Mike Norvell, there's a guy who lives in Tallahassee right now, who's one of the best developers of quarterbacks. He has been one of the best developers of quarterbacks in the past. Who has made enough money and is continuing to get paid by an organization that you'd barely need to pay him, who has a bit of an itch to coach. I would, I would very much, I, I would, I would ask the question. I would approach Jimbo Fisher and say, Hey, you have any interest in coaching quarterbacks for us? I'm not talking about coordinator or anything else. I'm just, you know, getting your, getting your, getting back into coaching a little bit. And if not coaching quarterbacks, get them on the Clyde Christensen plan. What UNC did with Clyde Christensen, who coached Andrew Luck, Peyton Manning and, and, uh, Tom Brady in the NFL. He's one of the best quarterback coaches on the planet. Clyde Christensen. <laughs> UNC, after Christensen retired from the NFL, called Christensen up and said, Hey, you know, you, your, your, uh, your daughter lives in, in the region, right? You're moving up here. Hey, um, you, you want to be a quarterback analyst for us and work with Drake May and, and whoever's after him? You know, you don't really need to do much other than, you know, run the quarterback drills and, you know, be in meetings and so on and help them with that. And you know, we're not asking you to coordinate or anything like that, but you can kind of be in semi-retirement, but still be working with these young men and, and making them better. 
And Christensen has been absolutely enormous for that program. He's also a guy I've learned from some since he's been up here, up in, up at, uh, up at North Carolina. To me, if I'm Mike Norvell, I'm approaching Jimbo Fisher and saying, hey, you know, you interested in maybe, maybe looking at our quarterbacks, helping them out a little bit? And if you want to be on staff as a quarterback's coach and potentially, you know, recruit, great. That gives us an ace recruiter. And if not, then, you know, just come into the office a few times, you know, come into the office and, and, you know, five days a week, work with our quarterbacks five, six days a week. And then, you know, you're in semi-retirement, but you're, you, you can bring your acumen to the film room and also, you know, help run the quarterback drills and help us, you know, really make sure that they're doing the right things in terms of quarterback drills to get our guys fully developed. I would do that if I was Mike, Mike Norvell. And I know some of you think I'm crazy and some of you know that like, I look, I have a lot of respect for Jimbo Fisher. I also think Jimbo Fisher is one of the best quarterback guys in the country. And in terms of throwing motion and some of those things, I think he's one of the few college quarterback coaches that I, I think actually understands the biomechanics and, and understands how to help guys become better throwers. There aren't very many of those. I mean, I've told you guys, you know, Phil Longo, for example, when he was at North Carolina, I asked him what I ask everybody that I talk to on these sorts of things. When I talk to them in clinics or when I visit different places and I talk to quarterback coaches, I asked him what he did for, you know, helping guys become better throwers. And he said, I don't. I recruit throwers. If they can't throw, if they can't, if they can't make the throws I need, then I go and get another one. And that that's worked out pretty well for him in general. But I think if you're if you're going to be the best you can be, I think you've got to also develop guys on your roster. And I don't think Florida State does that as well. And if Tokars remains at quarterbacks coach, I would have some issues in that respect. I don't expect him to be the quarterbacks coach next year. I, 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 I suspect that Tokars is going to move to the tight ends position, which he's coached before. And he's a good coach, guys. And he's, a, he's an excellent recruiter. I think he's a guy you want on your staff, but I would go and get a certified, proven quarterback developer to make sure that Croman Hawk was ready to go, if not next year, certainly in 2026 and ready to be an NFL guy after that. But I think you've also got to go out and you've got to seriously pursue top level talent in the, in the transfer portal at quarterback. And I think you need to get Carter Smith. I said that before. I've said that for a couple of weeks now. And I know that the interest is mutual with Carter Smith. You know, he grew up a knoll. So you got to close the deal there, maybe pay the money if need be. And yeah, do what you need to do. But there I, there are changes coming. Now, a few things, you know, I, I got questioned once again. Somebody asked me on Twitter, do you still think, you know, do you still believe that that Florida State should not fire Mike Norvell? <sighs> Y'all, what what would have changed between now and a week ago that would have made me change my mind? Like this game was exactly what I expected. Like even down to almost e exactly the yards per play that each team had. Down to Florida State scoring 3 points. This was exactly what I expected. So why would that change my view? Like, we just got to play out the string. And I told y'all, this game is going to go so badly that more and more people are going to want Norvell fired after this game. But none of it changes anything. The, like the math doesn't change. The situation doesn't change. You take the $9 million a year, whatever it is, that you would have to pay Norvell not to coach. And you take that $9 million, you collect it, and you put that towards players. And you win. This guy has won before. It's not as much of a dice roll to win with someone who's won before as someone who's new in your program. So unless you just really want to sell the boosters and whoever on hope, and then, you know, you think that that hope can compensate for that much money lost. Well, you know, that's a different thing. But I, I think it would be foolish to fire Mike Norvell at this point. I think you need to basically let him make the changes that need to be made and you're going to have an entirely different staff and a, a very different roster next year. So, you know, that's been my, that's been what I've said from the beginning. And that's what I'm going to keep saying. So got a few other 
questions to get through. Next question is, uh, I think, a, an interesting one. Um, this is from Dave. Uh, I seem to, he says, I seem to remember Bud Elliott talking about how historically bad uh, that Taggart offensive line in 2018, 2019 was as far as average depth of first contact and it being literally one of the wor- worst ever recorded. I'm generally wondering if you think this offensive line group's performance is worse than the Taggart low mark. I wasn't sure if recency bias was affecting my judgment. This year's group is so hard to watch. So I, I actually dug dug into the stats just, just very quickly. I didn't take a full look. Um, but my my impression looking at this is that this is not quite as bad as those teams. And here's why. 20, 2024, the offensive line has given up 30 sacks in nine games, 9.7% sack percentage. So that's the percentage of dropbacks that end in a sack and a 45% pressure rate. But the average time to throw is 3.12 seconds. So they're holding on to it pretty pretty far. And average time to pressure is 2.56 seconds. And the problem of this offensive line has been primarily pass blocking. They've been poor in run blocking as well, but they've been a train wreck anytime a quarterback drops back. As we saw tonight, they, they were able to run the football with some success, but as soon as they dropped back, they it was clown show. If you go to 2018... The sack percentage and pressure percentage are actually a little bit better. 7.3%, 36 sacks in 12 games, 36.6% pressure rate. So a little bit better across the board, except that average time to throw is 2.38 and average time to pressure allowed was 2.26, which is almost half a second less time for the quarterback. Then you get to 2019 and it's a worse sack number, 48 sacks in 13 games, 10% sack rate, which is worse than Florida State's giving up now. 2.75 2.75 average time to throw, so more time to throw, but then 2.34 pressure rate allowed, and then almost the same pressure percentage on that with just overall worse numbers across the board. That 2019 offensive line is still worse than this one, which, I mean, that's not saying much. This is still bottom five, probably, in power five pr- offensive lines in the past 20 years is my guess, if not bottom three, that 2019 offensive line might be the worst though. It's a good question. It's, it is so, it is indeed so hard to watch. So, so hard to watch. All right. I'm going to go through a few more uh, questions just because I can, uh, since I'm not going to spend much more time uh, or I'm not going to spend any more time on the, on the Notre Dame game. So then this, this next one, Uh, In a recent podcast, you mentioned that Mike Norvell is highly respected in the coaching community and is looked at as a good offensive mind for the game. I'm sure he knows Florida State cannot fire him with his buyout. So at what point does what is going on in the Florida State program under him hurt his coaching reputation? He's in season five, and statistically, the Florida State offense is among the worst in the country in Florida State history. At some point, I would think that Mike Norvell realizes the damage he is doing to the program, and that will resonate within the coaching circles to the point another program might not want him being their coach. If this is the case, why continue to damage your reputation anymore? Why not just resign and save whatever reputation you had from building the program from to, from a, to a 13-win season and potential berth in the college football playoff? At some point, he has to put his pride aside and realize this. If I were an AD, yes, Mike Norvell looks like a good option to pull, build my program up, but seeing him destroy Florida State, why would I take that chance? I'm sure if the AD can have a sincere conversation with him and let him know that, that is, this is not acceptable, and if the money were there to buy out his contract, he would be gone. When Mike Norvell says repeatedly... Uh, this is not acceptable. I'm sure he believes that, but he still takes his money and goes about his business. Anyway, sorry for the long question. I'm sure you understand what I'm asking. I have pride in what I do every day, but I also have another respect for my organ enough respect for my organization to say enough is enough and move on. If I'm doing more harm than good, thank you for all your, uh, whatever. Okay. So it's a good question. Um, answer is this Mike Norvell knows that this is unacceptable. Nobody is more embarrassed, humiliated, angry, and frustrated than him. Like this is his livelihood. This is something he takes great pride in. And especially on the offensive side, he's always been able to run the football, always been able to to call an offense that has been among the best in the country. This is completely an aberration in his career. And he is beyond frustrated and angry and embarrassed by this. Absolutely true. But if you think that Mike Norvell would then conclude from that, that the best thing to do is to run from the problem, then you don't know Mike Norvell. 
for Mike Norvell, the idea is, is not, okay, well, I'm doing more harm than good. His thought is, okay, I need to clean house so that I can fix this. That man completely believes that, again, based on prior performance and everything else, he fully believes I can fix this and I will fix this when I get guys who are all pulling in the same direction and I'm about to go get those guys. And if you're talking about saving his reputation, quitting now is certainly not going to do that. If he's able to turn things around and win eight games or 10 games next year, all of a sudden his reputation bounces back with a quickness. Now his reputation among in coaching circles has not really taken a big hit. Those people know no ball. They're looking at this and going, my gosh, that's bad. And that's a poorly coached team, no doubt. But Mike Norvell still has respect because guys know what, what kind of coach he is, what kind of human being he is. So you'll see guys want to coach with him when, when, when things open up. And you're not going to see him voluntarily step aside and, and you know, just say, hey, you know, I'll, I'll reduce my buyout or whatever. You're not going to see that because this man wants to be able to fix this problem because this is an embarrassment to him. And he believes he can fix it. End of story. All right, next one. You've said that Norvell is holding coaches accountable behind closed doors. Two questions. One, if this is true, how or why are vets continually making mistakes and not being benched? And two, why is he never held the staff accountable to recruiting standards? Our recruiting stinks even when we were 13 and no lazy recruiting by assistant coaches, not keeping them accountable. So that's a good, a good point. So number two, I think on the recruiting side, Norvell really believed that they could do more with, without the kind of high pressure tactics that some of the, some other programs employ. And I think that view is shifting a little bit. Uh, and I think you're going to see some shift in that respect this next time, this, this next cycle with the next staff. The second thing in terms of vets making mistakes and not being benched, the real problem is that you, the bench is a, is a motivator when you've got somebody else who can actually do it on your roster. The problem is when these vets are benched, somebody else comes out there and gets beat worse. It goes back to, you know, people want to DJ Uyunglele off the field. And I kept saying like, guys, it's not going to get better. When that guy goes to the sideline, there's a reason that Brock Glenn is not playing and Luke Krummenhawk is not ready yet. Y'all remember me saying that? And people said, well, it can't be worse. Oh yeah, it can. We just saw it. We just saw a team drop back 34 times for a net yardage of 37 yards in this game. Yeah, it got worse without DJ Uyungle. It got worse. And the same is true across the board. Now, sometimes you do need to bench a guy just because, and, and even if you're going to take a hit just because of the, the disciplinary aspect of it, but it's hard to do. And yeah, that, that's, that's it. The other thing is, and you can actually see there's a point in this game late in the game where a freshman defensive back made a mistake and they gave up a, uh, a first down along the sideline, got him down inside the 10 yard line. And the camera cut to Norvell, who was just, you could see him just seething once again. And they're talking about, about him and all this. And then he pulls the microphone down and, and, and you know, you can hear, you can tell there's some chatter going on in his headphones. Somebody says something, and he pulls the microphone down and just says, doesn't matter. <laughs> Which is exactly where I think he is right now. Where it's like, doesn't matter right now. This he has, he has chewed out like, at next level ice and fire, some of these guys on staff, but we're, we're well past that. Now we're at the point where the, you know, I'm done with you. You're not going to be here next year, that kind of stuff. And at that point, you're not really, it's not even an accountability thing. It's just like, how do you, how do you even work with that? Like, you know, that guy is not going to be there. And this is unlike most workplaces where if you're in that situation in virtually any other workplace, it's you're, you're done. You just pack your stuff up. You don't need to be here tomorrow, but this is a world where the season doesn't stop and you can't hire a replacement until after the season. So you play out the string with those guys who they're dead men walking. And what are you going to do? You're going to waste your breath on, on that. He's chewed him out. He's spit fire, but at this point, it's done. So, yeah. 
Okay. Next one is, uh, as a casual follower of Auburn, I definitely, so, so this is, I would, uh, I'd love your insight on identity and how it applies specifically to Norville's time at FSU. As a casual follower of Auburn, I definitely saw Kenny, uh, I guess is about Dillingham, Dillingham's mark in on the offense in 2021, especially outside of scripted drives. In 22, it felt like so much more of an identity with an exception of NC State looking a whole lot more like the end of last season in retrospect. But all last year to my untrained eye, it felt like some kind of constant struggle to avoid what I thought was the ident- what I thought was the identity, whether that was to uh, protect JT, frustration with offensive tackle play, or being so torn over how to distribute the ball with so many high profile mouths that needed to be fed, to the point that uh, those lost drives last year were inflict- were inf- self inflicted by grab bagging while also lacking in creativity. I would love to hear your opinion on how any of these factors could have masked underlying uh, problems with the O line as well as what the outlook would be in the future if Mike hires a new offensive coordinator who will still operate within his base concepts. So that's a great question. So first of all, yeah, Dillingham def- definitely did have impact on the identity of the offense and the way that they did certain things. And, you know, the coordinator does coordinate. You know, Norvell works with the guys that he has on staff and he'll call the game for sure. But this is not he's not a dictator. He's not, you know, he's not Jimbo Fisher in this respect, who's going to essentially coordinate to a large degree and call his offense where it's it is his offense and he's going to he's going to be very flexible per, perhaps over flexible in terms of how he's going to call it based on his quarterback skill set and some other things but it's Jimbo who's who's running running everything from start to finish on the offensive side with Norvell it's not quite that he he's working with you know what his guys feel they do best and what their personnel does best and there's a little bit more uh of give and take in that respect and so you could see the identity sort of change and shift from when Dillingham was in was offensive coordinator even though he was not the play caller to Atkins being the coordinator and there's some some shift there uh I do think that it's accurate though that they they really got an identity in 21 and 22 and then in 23 that identity offensively kind of dissipated as as you said they kind of grab bagged a lot last year and I thought they did that I thought last year they really tried to call Call for players, not plays. So essentially like, okay, let's go for this matchup and we're going to call this to take advantage of that matchup. There was a lot of that. Uh, And that can really get you off of your identity to some degree. But I also think that the other thing that they struggled with last year is that they gave up a lot of penetration on on the inside of the offensive line and they didn't have a consistent enough running game. I mean, this is an offense that we've... Uh, mentioned this before since 2020 Florida state's average distance to go on third down is eighth highest among N- uh, FBS teams 7.65 yards per play or, or yards to go is the average third down and, and long Florida state has had since 2020. So the offense has been in third and third and long a lot since 2020. And you know, that's a, that's a problem that goes back into 2023 it was, a, it was there to some degree in 2022. And when they, when you can't run your base concepts for consistent positive yardage, which they couldn't even then to the degree that you would expect for that to be an identity, then yeah, sometimes you grab bag a little more. And I think, you know, the other thing is that the, the receivers and personnel that they had were more, you know, big body mismatch type, big play type guys. And then you had a, you had in Jordan Travis, a guy who was not an especially accurate thrower on a lot of the concepts that you want for possession type passing, but he was a very good deep ball thrower, good shot play type guy, and a guy who could could make certain intermediate downfield throws well and, and read defense as well. So what do you do with that? Well, you turn to what they did. They essentially carved an offense out around Jordan Travis, and they called plays really around his limitations and around some of the limitations on the offensive line and so on. And yes, that masked some of those other things because they were designed to mask it. The problem is that they came into this year not expecting to have to mask all that stuff. They thought they were going to be just where they needed to be. Okay, we finally were five years in offensive line. We've got enough bodies to actually be reliable. You walk into practice. This team looks the part. Finally, on the offensive line, these guys are going to be able to get it done. 
and then they can't run the ball and they're worse at some of those base things that they want to stake uh, stake as their identity and hang their hat on. They're worse at those things than they ever have been. And then you don't have the things that Jordan Travis is able to do that you could call to, that you could go to. You don't have Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman and Jaheim Bell and some of these guys that you can go, OK, well, you know, in the absence of being able to do what we want our identity to be, well, we can still toss it up and let that guy go get it. And he's still pretty good. They don't have that. And so then all of those things manifest. And that connects to another question that I got, which is given that stat of eighth highest average on third down to go among uh, FBS teams since 2020, does this have to do with the way that the offensive line is coached and schemed? And is it truly time for a change in philosophy? I don't think it's time for a change in philosophy. I mean, they're running the same stuff that that Gus Malzahn does. It's the same, the same. It's the same terminology. It's coached the same way in terms of conceptually. All of that stuff is sound, but I do think that there, there's got to be a change in the way you coach it and teach it and hold guys accountable to do it. Because it doesn't matter what you know, and it doesn't matter whether the scheme is good. What matters is whether or not you can get those guys to do it reliably and to rep it so many times that they can't do it wrong. And they're not there. That's the problem. So, uh, final question. There's some people that don't think Atkins will be let go at the end of the season because of the high school recruits he is bringing in this cycle and last do you keep Coach Atkins if you are Norvell because of the blue chip high school recruits he's bringing in, even if he is demoted to just offensive line coach? What are your thoughts? I've been turning this one over in my head for a good while. And I'll be honest, I don't know. Because I would have to, I would have to be in those meeting rooms and I would have to have a very good sense of, okay, if I, if I fire him and I bring in another offensive line coach, do I lose Solomon Thomas? Do I lose somebody that actually might be a plug and play guy? Do I lose, you know, what, what do I lose? But the thing is, I don't think you can let a coach hold you hostage over one or two recruits as good as those recruits might be. So I think you have to factor it in. I think you also have to factor in that Florida state was getting better and better on the offensive line in 2020, 2021, 2022. It started to slip a little bit and then 2023, it slipped more. And then this year it fell off. That correlates exactly to when Atkins took over the offensive coordinator position and ceased being just the offensive line coach. So if you believe that just getting him to be full time with the offensive line is actually going to fix it. Then maybe you keep him around, maybe, maybe. But if you've got another offensive line coach on the hook that you think can actually you can make that change and that guy might still be able to land those guys. And that guy's actually, you think, going to be more guaranteed to actually produce what you need on the field? Then you make the change. But I wouldn't be surprised if Atkins got demoted to just offensive line coach and they brought in a coordinator and made, you know, mo- again, I think moving uh, tow cars away from quarterbacks, get a coordinator and, uh, you know, who coaches either quarterbacks or receivers and, you know, bring in a new quarterbacks and receivers coach, whichever one the coordinator doesn't coach. And then I think you need to supplement with some analysts. Like I said, I would, if Jimbo Fisher wanted to come in in the Clyde Christensen kind of quasi retired, but working with the quarterbacks kind of role, uh, look, that, that wouldn't hurt. That's a guy who have your quarterbacks hitting their targets more. So we'll see, but I do think you're going to see some high level guys come into Tallahassee to essentially try to, try to fix some things, but we'll see. So, um, I, I said, I, I lied. La- I said that was the last question, but here's one more. It's an ethics question. If a coach that is recruiting a particular prospect knows he's, he's getting let go. Does he tell the recruiter? Is he vague about his future? That has to play a part in some of the relationships I'm assuming of decommitments and whatnot. Yeah, that does play a part. Um, and it varies by coach. Uh, generally you do want to be honest with players. Uh, if you don't know for sure that you're not going to be there, then you can't really tell them you're not going to be there. But, you know, the writing might be on the wall. 
you might not have actually been told that you're going, you're, you're going to be terminated, but you know, it may be enough and you might just not be quite as active or aggressive in terms of trying to retain some of these guys that that can happen. There's a variety of different ways to play this. To me, the eth- the most ethical way is to continue doing things exactly the way you're going to do them until the day that you no longer are employed by that institution. I don't think most guys do that exactly. Um, and it's still hard because then you start getting questions from those guys that you're recruiting of like, are you going to be there? I mean, what, what's going on? And you say, well, you know what? I don't know. And the best way to answer that is I don't know. But one thing I know is that this is a great school, a great institution, a great team, great program. And if I'm not here, the person who replaces me is going to be even better than me. And he, he, he'll take care of you. That's the, that's the right way to answer it. But tough. It's hard to do. Well, I think that'll do for tonight. Um, it, we're coming into a we're coming into a bye week. I don't know that, how much I'm going to do. I mean, I, I probably will break down some of the film on this. I, I, I do not expect to do the whole game. But I'll probably break down some of it uh, over on on YouTube as usual. Other than that, I mean, I just uh, I don't know that there's a whole lot of breath to waste on this. So unless there are some terminations and things to discuss, I'm probably going to take a little bit of of, of time not. Uh, doing this until until we get to next week but uh we'll see there might be enough questions that roll in that i'll do a mailbag episode or something like that but uh i guess i'll uh i'll talk to you when i talk to you if you've been enjoying this podcast please leave a five-star rating over at apple podcasts and wherever else you listen to podcasts post and repost episodes on social media and tell a friend. And if you haven't left a review in a while, do it again. It really does help the visibility of the podcast. Before we go, I'd also like to thank my advertising partners once more. That's EPR Creations, Luis Marquez of Momentum Realty in Jacksonville, Florida, Shenandoah Real Estate in the Research Triangle of North Carolina, Garage Makeovers, the number one garage remodeling company in South Florida, and Justin Galloway of Benchmark Mortgage, serving Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky. You can also stop by the Unconquered shop at unconqueredpodcast.com where you can buy stickers, pins, magnets, t-shirts, and other swag. I am especially grateful for those of you at the Dynasty level. That is Brian Leininger, Dave Blair, Jack Horton, Jonathan Kennedy, Lee Caswell, Travis Smith, and Tyler Kashishki. You all are far more generous than I deserve. Thanks to you all. This has been Unconquered with Doc Staples. I'm your host, Jason Staples. Thanks for listening and thanks for your support. I made this.